Hello! Happy Friday everyone. I hope that you are doing good. And first of all, I do want to acknowledge a few things today with uh, the fires that are burning the West Coast here. My heart reaches out to everyone who is there, including the wildlife, the s firefighters who are fighting, you know, untiringly to get this under control. My heart reaches out to you. Also, it's 9-11, so our hearts do feel heavy. And besides the pandemic, that is still going on. But uh, it is what it is, and prayers and love to everyone, and hope we are past all of this soon. So with that said, um, I want to talk a little bit about our topic today. It's very, very special for me because all of you have heard enough from me about the thyroid. You know, I love talking about that and it comes from my personal, you know, suffering from it in a way. So this is my book, Seven Steps to Heal Your Thyroid. Uh, and today I have a special guest. His name is Dr. Anshul Gupta. And uh, the topic is going to be you know, the root causes that affect uh, the thyroid dysfunction or cause the thyroid dysfunction. And actually, I came across his Instagram page a few months ago and I was so excited because I'm like, wow, there's somebody who is, you know, has a similar approach like me in practice and uh, he loves to educate people. I follow him on Instagram and uh, uh, pretty soon when I see him here, I will invite him and then begin with his introduction. So let me see. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining all the people who are here. Shaheen, um, D.S. Sharma, Sonal. Hi to all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, hi, Dwani. Yes, this is going to be very informative for you especially if you are suffering from a thyroid condition which is so common actually in women one in five women suffer from this so why is all this happening we'll learn all about it today um, thanks for saying hello Shaheen so I am going to wait to see um, Dr. Gupta, and once I see him, I'm going to send him an invitation. I hope that all of you are doing well and getting ready for um, the weekend. The weather here in Arizona is a little bit better, finally. Um, the morning was cool today. So, you know, all of you that know me and follow me, you know that um, I've written this book, Seven Steps to Heal Your Thyroid, from my personal journey. You know, I, my, my thyroid was probably undiagnosed for two decades. Like growing up as a teenager, I suffered from so many symptoms, but nobody thought about checking the thyroid. So that is why I'm very passionate that if somebody is complaining, and presenting these symptoms to me like feeling so tired, having unexplained weight gain, having hair loss uh, like excessively, um, feeling cold, prone to constipation, acne, so many things. The list goes on. It's always important to check the thyroid and not only the screening test for thyroid, but make sure that you ask your doctor to check a comprehensive thyroid panel. You know which is I call it as a complete thyroid panel and uh, that includes not only the TSH which is your pituitary hormone but it includes the T4 T3 um, it includes the free T3 free T4 the thyroid antibodies and I see dr. Gupta has joined so I'm going to send him an invitation so we can hear it from him today Thank you everyone for joining Priyanshu. Good morning, Dr. Gupta. Good morning. How are you doing? 
I am doing good. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. That is great. I'm so thankful and excited that you have joined me today. Uh, I was just sharing with the viewers that, you know, when I saw your Instagram page a few months ago, I was really excited because uh, it felt like, uh, you know, somebody has a similar approach to practice, you know, for what I do. So I wanted to bring you on. You have wonderful information, very educational. And I love your thyroid Thursdays as well. So... Uh -huh. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to the viewers, and uh, and then we'll ask you more about yourself. So, uh, hi again, everyone. Thanks for everyone who is joining in. Dr. Gupta, Dr. Anshul Gupta is a board-certified family medicine doctor, and he's also done a fellowship uh, in functional medicine from the prestigious institute, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, actually, with Dr. Mark Hyman. That's awesome. So um, he, you know, uses functional medicine in his practice, um, similar to what I do as well. And I believe in integrative medicine, you know, approach to help my patients by treating the root cause. So our topic today is going to be the root causes of thyroid dysfunction and what one can do to get you know, these, how, how to get better, basically, by uh, correcting these root causes. So with uh, that said, uh, Dr. Gupta, please uh, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you located, uh, you know, and what led you to do what you are doing today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that great introduction, uh, Meghna. I really appreciate that. And yeah. Also appreciate you, you know, me calling on the show, you know, um, as you said, you know, we just have been in contact for just very short amount of time. But, you know, you are doing awesome job of, you know, introducing, you know, people to all these educational things about thyroid. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, you're correct that, you know, our approach is very similar, right? You know, naturopathic physicians, you know, are kind of, I, I feel that, you know, they were way ahead of our time. Uh, so they were already using a lot of stuff that, you know, now we are learning about. So being trained as a traditional family medicine doctor, you know, I had no idea like how natural things can be so much helpful, you know, for chronic diseases, especially like thyroid patients. So that's where, you know, after I got training in functional medicine, I started working in the Cleveland Clinic. You know, that's where I started digging deeper into the research about, you know, why, you know, thyroid patients or these chronic disease patients are not getting better, especially Hashimoto's patients, you know, because we were treating Hashimoto's just as a regular thyroid disorder by just giving them levothyroxine or thyroid hormone, while their problem was totally different, right? So that's the reason these patients do not get better. So they continue to suffer from symptoms, you know, with weight issues, with brain fog, with fatigue, with hair issues, all of those. And, you know, the levothyroxine does, doesn't do anything for them. So that's where, you know, I started developing protocols to help, you know, Hashimoto's patients to get better. So that's where I developed my three-step process uh, wherein I help my patients go through it um, and then help them reverse a lot of their symptoms and also improve their thyroid numbers. That is excellent. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing that, you know. And I would love to hear, uh, you know, and educate everybody about what your three-step approach is, actually. So did you want to address that right now or get into uh, the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Yeah, so the three-step process actually includes the root cause analysis because the first step, you know, in the three-step is actually knowing why are people getting sick, right? Why are Hashimoto's patients sick? So the first step is actually identifying the root causes of people's Hashimoto's or thyroid diseases. So that's the first step that we try to identify. And then in the second step, we try to start fixing the thyroid and also an important organelle, which is called mitochondria. So a lot of people, you know, like, you know, have mitochondrial dysfunction in thyroid, and that's the reason they do not improve their symptoms. So just for kind of viewers, you know, who might be new to what mitochondria is. So mitochondria is basically powerhouse of our cell, right? You know, that's, what, that's where how we make energy and, you know, produce energy for our body. So in thyroid patients, this mitochondria is not working you know, along with the thyroid gland dysfunction. So in the second step, I work on both of those 
uh, rejuvenation of mitochondria and regeneration of thyroid. And in the third step, in the final step, we kind of help them to kind of do a gentle detox and also address their underlying infections that needs to be removed for them to kind of get healed completely. Fantastic. Wow. We'll have to do more talks to get, uh, you know, our viewers educated about all of this. So that is wonderful. I love your three-step approach. But let's get started with the first step today, which are the root causes for the thyroid dysfunction. So Dr. Gupta, please uh, educate us. What are the different root causes, you know, and what is your approach to the treatment for that? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, like, what do we mean by root causes, right? A lot of people, you know, have, do not have any idea about what the root causes, you know, what that terminology means. So in s simple terms, root causes are basically anything that is external to your body around in your environment, which has a potential to hurt your thyroid. So that's kind of in simple terminology that I can say. Now, there is a whole bunch of things, you know, like when I was doing research, to identify each and every root cause that might be present. So starting the first step or the first you know, root cause that I identify in most of the people is what we call as food sensitivities, okay? So a lot of people have food sensitivity issues. You know, our food is changing rapidly. So a lot more people are developing sensitivities or allergies to different kinds of food. So that's what is happening. Uh, the second thing that I see or, you know, identify is toxins. A lot of people have issues with toxins. So that's another thing that happens. Uh, toxins can be mold toxins, can be environmental toxins, can be heavy metals. So those are all the toxins then, you know, people might have. And then um, the third root cause is infections. So, you know, uh, there are several infections which can be associated with it, you know, especially uh, like viral infections, Epstein-Barr virus being a top most, you know, in that issue, or what we call as infectious mononucleosis. Uh, then we have parasites, then we have Lyme disease. All of those infections can, can be the root cause. The fourth category is nutritional insufficiencies. So, you know, our thyroid needs a lot of nutrients to function. And a lot of times, you know, our body is not able to give thyroid all those nutrients that it needs. And that's again leads to Hashimoto's or thyroid dysfunction. And the last category is what I call is stress or trauma. You know, um, so all of us, you know, goes through some or the other kind of stress, you know, during our lives. Uh, but that stress stays in our body. And then that can ultimately present in the form of a thyroid disorder or like in Hashimoto's. So those are the five kind of root causes. Those are five categories, you know, obviously they have more things in them, but these are the, the, the big categories of things that we need to address or look for in people. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta. And uh, you listed them so systematically and nicely, and I'm going to ask you some more questions about that. And some people are saying hello to us, so I just want to acknowledge and say thank you so much for joining us today. And if you think that this video could help anybody that is suffering from the thyroid condition, please feel free to share it with them. So, um, Dr. Gupta, you said the first one in regards to food sensitivities. So... Have you noticed in your practice that by working on their gut health, you know, their food sensitivity or food tolerance gets better generally? It can. So it depends on person to person. But, you know, a lot, lot of times, you know, like it's kind of, you know, like whether the food sensitivities are causing gut dysfunction or the gut dysfunction is causing food sensitivities, right? You know, it is like a chicken or egg situation. We just do not know, right? So... So in a lot of people, you know, when we start addressing their gut, you know, or start healing their gut, you know, like especially the gut permeability issue. So if we start fixing the gut permeability for a lot of people, their food sensitivities do get better and they're able to tolerate a lot more food. So a typical example is that, you know, like I saw a patient like a couple of weeks ago and the only foods that she could eat was there were like five foods, literally five foods. She said that's the only food she can eat. If she tried to eat anything else, then she will just get sensitive and she will react to it. And now we're in the process of healing her gut. So she just sent me a message saying that, you know, you know, hooray that, you know, I was able to introduce, you know, some more foods, you know, like to my diet. So I was like, good, bingo. 
So our goal is to obviously expand their diet as much as possible so that they get, you know, all the nutrients through diet and don't have to rely on supplements and things. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And I know as a practitioner, we get so excited, you know, when our patients progress. And I know like uh, with the kind of approach that we have, you know, sometimes patients are really suffering chronically for years, you know. So when they see a little bit of improvement, uh, it gets both them and us excited. And I, I asked you that question because uh, that's what I generally notice when I order the food sensitivity test. Uh, a lot of times patients sometimes get confused because, you know, the first time they came up with certain sensitivities, another time of some different sensitivities, more or less. So then they don't know exactly what to follow. With that said, I mean, that's a very effective, uh, you know, testing and that I use in the practice. But uh, I've also noticed uh, just like you by working on their gut integrity and you know helping their leaky gut if there is inflammation and helping you know repair that you know really helps them to absorb and assimilate foods so much better. So you know thank you so much. And then um, you mentioned the toxins. Uh, there are so many different toxins that you mentioned, like with the heavy metals and all of that. I wanted to ask you the role of mold. You know, I saw that on your Instagram page as well. Like, how does uh, the mold tox, you know, affect the thyroid? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like uh, since, you know, like I started looking or digging more deeper into the mold issue, I was so astonished that, you know, we have actually good research, you know, showing that, you know, more toxins can affect, you know, autoimmune diseases, especially thyroid. So that was huge for me. And I had no idea about it, you know, before that stuff. So mold, you know, like, you know, it's like, first of all, like, you know, it's you know, like mold is almost everywhere in our environment, right? You know, like if, if any time, you know, you had any water damage to your building or like flooding to your house, or like kind of, you know, anything else, right? You know, all your basement, like this kind of smells musty. Those are all signs that, you know, like there is with like, you know, mold in you know, houses. So it's very difficult to get avoid mold, but there are certain people who actually react to mold than the others. So in those people, you know, like mold is basically acts as a trigger. So it starts a process of inflammation in their body and then ultimately leads to development of antibodies. So those antibodies, you know, again, depending on each and every individual's genetic makeup, start attack attacking different parts of the body. And in females, especially middle-aged females, their thyroids, for some reason, is easier to attack. So that's where those antibodies start attack attacking the thyroid and ultimately destroys it. And that's what we call as Hashimoto's, or then ultimately leads to low thyroid issues. So it's kind of very interesting that, you know, mold does that. And then... You know, we even call it kind of, you know, uh, CIRS, C -I -R -S, which is like, you know, chronic inflammatory response um, that we see that happens from mold. So again, you know, like no more and more research is coming up on that. But that was very interesting that we already know about this piece, but nobody's talking about it. Yes. Thank you. And it's fascinating, all this research that is coming out. You know, I love how the science is backing up all of this information now um, to provide evidence-based medicine, you know, because uh, that's what people are looking for. And uh, so what kind of a test can people do to find out if they are sensitive to mold? So, yeah, so there are two kinds of tests, you know, that you can do. First of all, you know, there is a test to check for mold in your environment, right? So let's say, you know, you're living in a house or you're living in a workplace where you want to kind of, you know, check this, you know, so there are different kinds of mold tests available. Um, so then you can use those. And the second test is that if you want to check if you, if a person is harboring mold toxins in their own system. So the best test, you know, that, you know, like uh, there are not many companies which are offering it, but Great Plains is a company which, you know, like offers this urine mycotoxin test. Wonderful test, you know, you know, like gives you good information because, you know, we do not want to know, you know, like whether we are sensitive to mold, but we want to know exactly which mycotoxin that your body is harboring. So this test kind of clearly gives you a detailed analysis of what mycotoxin your body has and how much of it you have. And then, you know, like then, you know, once you start working on getting rid of those mycotoxins, then you can repeat it to see whether you're getting better or not. That is wonderful. Yes. So, um, so typically, like, uh, when you see a patient who 
where you run this uh, test by great plains and you find these mycotoxins like what is your treatment approach for that like um, you know do you use natural um you know things that can help it or do you prescribe medications i'm sure it depends case based uh, but you know just wanted to ask you yes no so yeah that so in regular conventional medicine they don't recognize mold as a pathogen right unless you have a systemic disease like blastomycosis or something like that right that's the only time they kind of realize it so unfortunately conventional medicine has no medications that can you know help with mold issues so all of our research and all of our understanding comes from natural medicine so in mold uh, cases you know like what i work is that first of all i try to optimize their natural detox pathways okay so we have five you know uh, detox pathways that our body detoxifies through first is our gut so i make sure that you know they are pooping regularly uh, the second thing is through your kidney so i ask them to in- drink lots and lots of water so they pee out toxins the third way is by sweating so i ask them to either use a sauna if they have an access to a infrared sauna that is even better if they don't have you know regular saunas are available in various gyms so people can do it so sweating is third way the fourth way is to your lymphatic system right so that's where dry brushing is very very helpful if people have access to like massages you know and things that can be helpful so that's the fourth way and the fifth way of detox is through your liver so then we work on optimizing their liver which is there are some supplements which can be helpful there is like milk thistle that can be helpful for them you know and turmeric or curcumin you know or green tea so those are all great to kind of support you know that liver function so this is the first step where i optimize their natural detox pathways they start working for it now the second the second step is more specific towards mold toxins so mold toxins you know first of all you want to use some binders so binders you know help to bind all the mold toxins which are present in a person's body so that's the first thing there are several binders available you know a lot of people use them on a daily basis like charcoal and cholera and you know bentonite clay you know all that stuff right so you know some i generally use a combination of those to kind of optimize their binding capacity then you know then we again want to optimize the detox of mold so that's where glutathione is one important you know uh, detoxifier and antioxidant that we use a lot of times so that's uh, that's what we use and then there are other certain you know other uh, detoxifying supplements that we help out you know for the mold toxins to get rid of it and then as you said case by case basis some people get better with this thing a lot of people need a little bit more advanced protocols and that's where we just kind of you know based on their genetic makeup based on you know how high and which toxins are high then we can kind of add more supplements on that wonderful thank you you're a wealth of information as i said you know so everyone who's joining thank you uh, for being here and if you are suffering with a thyroid disorder this talk is really helpful for you and uh, dr gupta is addressing all the root causes that you know cause the thyroid dysfunction today so uh, please listen in feel free to share this video with anybody who you think needs this help so uh, thank you we talked about uh, all of that and let's ask you about uh, you mentioned the epstein barr virus right and um, you know generally like uh, i i want to know how helpful that is in your practice because sometimes like uh, you know when i like like usually sorry about my <laughs> what i'm trying to say is um uh, when i order labs for epstein barr especially you know if they've had a past infection you know that will kind of show up positive so if they're not having like uh, an igm or an active infection like how much does a past igg you know infection rate affect their thyroid because a lot of patients come back positive with it so mm-hmm. what do you do when they are igg positive and what would be your treatment approach for them yeah so that's kind of interesting part about epstein barr so you know again like you know i was looking at the research behind it because first of all we know that epstein barr virus is associated with hashimoto's disease and thyroid cancer we already know that for like you know a decade now so but then i started looking you know like why you know what is going on with that so what i realized was that you know there is some evidence that epstein barr virus 
can be reactivated in these thyroid patients and that ultimately leads to this Hashimoto's or thyroid cancer issues. So now the problem is that, you know, again, like, as you said, like the, our labs, you know, are not smart enough. When you order like a regular, uh, you know, like a check for like Epstein-Barr, they will most of the time, like you are actually more smarter that you're checking for their IgGs and like look, you're looking for the past infection. Most of the general practitioners will just order like a monospot test. And that will tell us that, that, that will tell them positive or negative. And that negative means that they do not have an acute infection. And that's not what we're looking for. We are looking for reactivation, right? So some of the labs, actually, you can order an expanded Epstein-Barr virus panel. So what it does is that it not only gives you IgG and IgMs, it also gives you like, you know, other things like there is something called nuclear antigens and nuclear antibodies. So that also gives you those numbers too. So now when you get those four or five different numbers, then you kind of look at the overall picture. If their IgG antibodies are super, super high, if their nuclear antigens and antibodies are like positive and high, that means that they are fighting that, you know, um, the Epstein bar, you know, on, the, on the, like an active basis right now. They might not have a full blown infection again. That's the reason the IgM will be negative, but everything else is super high. That means that is the, the you know, it is reactivated. And the reactivation needs to be addressed. Now, again, you know, in conventional medicine, we do not have anything to fight them, right? You know, there is no medicine for Epstein-Barr virus. So even if you go to a regular doctor, they will say, well, even if it is reactivated, it will go away on its own. You cannot do anything. But, you know, there are actually good supplements, which does help your immune system to keep that Epstein-Barr virus at bay. So first of all, once you get Epstein-Barr virus infection in your body, it is not going to go away from your body. So if somebody is telling you that, yes, you know, if you take the supplement or if you do the therapy, they will get the Epstein-Barr virus completely off from your body. That is right now not possible. Maybe in the future, but we do not have anything right now. But we can tame it. Okay, we can kind of tame that Epstein-Barr virus infection and keep it at bay so that it doesn't affect, you know, our body. So there is a, a supplement from Byron White. You know, it has a good supplement. You know, it's a good company. So it's called Byron White, and they have made a special supplement for Epstein-Barr virus, you know, on herpes virus, which is kind of the herpes family the Epstein-Barr virus is from. And it works amazing. A lot of my clients, you know, who have these, you know, reactivation of Epstein-Barr, I use it on them, and it works great. The good part, it is just herbal mixtures of, you know, different herbs from all over the world. So don't have much side effects and very well tolerated also. Fantastic. That is great. I love uh, all these solutions that you're providing uh, all these patients because, you know, most of the people that come in are basically complaining that they were, you know, given a levothyroxine you know, and they've suffered like for so many years, but they are just frustrated finding an answer because they are just not getting better. Their dose keeps increasing, but they still have all the symptoms or the symptoms keep getting worse. So, um, you know, let's have you talk about this. I have, I've talked a lot about like, you know, conversion of T4 to T3 and the nutrients that, uh, you know, help in all of that. So, um, I always explain to everyone that the T3, the active hormone, is so important and the level of it is important. You know, maybe you're increasing the dose of the levothyroxine, but it's not converting to the free T3. And that's what's, uh, you know, not helping your symptoms. So what can uh, people do and, you know, how can they find solutions? You know, who can they reach out to for help? Yes, absolutely. Very good question about T4 and T3. And as you said, a lot of people are not even aware of it uh, because most people will just check their TSH and not check anything more than that. Uh, so they miss the complete picture. So as you said, you know, T4 is a, is a hormone which is produced by the thyroid gland, but it has to be converted to T3, which is a more active version of, you know, thyroid hormone for your body to actually utilize it. So in a lot of people that conversion is not happening from T4 to T3 and that's the reason you know sometimes they suffer from these dreadful symptoms. So uh, again you know through research and through other things that you realize there are a few things which can be helpful for conversion of T4 to T3. You know there are some nutrients like zinc and selenium and magnesium. So those are all nice ways you know which can kind of help out with conversion of the T4 uh, to the T3. 
in terms of who they can work with i always recommend that you know if people have thyroid disorders and they do not have symptoms which are you know like controlled then they should always work with a more holistic physician whether it is a naturopath physician or a functional medicine doctor so that they can get the complete testing that way and then you know they can kind of you know optimize their thyroid hormone levels and also take the right supplements absolutely yes thank you thank you so much and then um um you know you mentioned like the ebv and the connection to the thyroid cancer i do see that thyroid cancer has become so much more common and it never used to be you know just the hypothyroidism and hashimotos being so common but now we see more cases of thyroid cancer as well so what do you think is causing that and you know what is the prognosis for that so again like if you look at the thyroid cancer you know again when they were looking at there are different kinds of cancers and they divide them you know what is the basic process so thyroid cancer is an interesting cancer because it is inflammatory cancer so what what that means is that you know they realize that inflammation is a key role which is playing you know or causing the cancer so that's interesting piece so i feel you know like in the present cases or present situations why we have more cases of thyroid cancer is either because of more infections and more toxins in our environment so toxins are a very big reason of inflammation in you know in uh, in everybody and almost almost like 90 plus percent of my clients that i see on the regular basis who have thyroid disorder will be suffering from one or the other toxins whether it is mold whether it is environmental whether it is glyphosate you know poisoning or whether it is you know like heavy metals something or other will be there so i think toxins is the number one and infections is the second reason that we have this you know a rise in the thyroid cancer currently okay yes yes thank you thank you for sharing that dr gupta yes so important you know like our environment and food and the ways we get you know exposed to all of these uh, infections and all of that and the choices that we make from day to day play such a big role for sure and then you had also mentioned like the stress and trauma affecting the thyroid you know so how does that happen and uh, you know what is your take on that yeah so again you know, like when i talk about stress everybody says when well, everybody stressed out so what's new about it right you know especially in the current circumstances you know like we are dealing with so much things so you know stress is kind of you know part of our life but what we don't realize is that you know stress is doesn't cause only psychological changes in our body it actually does physical changes so again there was a research study done you know where like you know like people who have these chronic issues with thyroid and hashimotos and cancer issues they all like looked at the childhood and they found out was that you know the more people had trauma or went through stress as their child has more chances of hashimotos and cancer and other issues later on like 30 40 years later on in their life so what they realized was that you know stress not only impacts a person physiologically or psychologically it can actually you know cause this different diseases so stress basically kind of you know our body the way our body responds to stress is by you know secreting a hormone called cortisol right which is an adrenal hormone very very important hormone and you know in short term basis in acute cases cortisol is life savior you know without cortisol we all will not survive but when the the stress just stays with our body for long term basis and when we keep on secreting that cortisol it actually starts harming our body you know it causes destruction to our body causes inflammation it is you know it actually starts impacting the functioning of other hormones like insulin like thyroid so it doesn't let them function as good as they should be and that's again the reason that ultimately that leads to thyroid disorder or leads to hashimotos yes thank you for sharing that and uh, again acknowledging everybody who is here and joining um our live talk i do want to invite you if you have any questions for dr gupta as you see he's a wealth of information you know uh, he'll be glad to help answer those for you so if anything uh you know thyroid related health related any questions uh please feel free to put it on the comments and uh, we will help address that for you yes absolutely so 
Yeah, yeah. I see, uh, you know, how passionate you are about educating, teaching, giving them the good, right tools, you know, that uh, people can use to get better. So that is fantastic. And um, so, Dr. Gupta, how can patients uh, uh, reach you, you know, if they wanted to? Yeah, so, I mean, the good part is that, you know, I established a virtual practice. So literally, I can just see, you know, clients or patients from like all over the world or any part of the, you know, like United States. Uh, so they can make an appointment with me that way. Uh, they can reach out, you know, on my website, which is unsuredguptamd.com. So, you know, and then, you know, they will get all the information from there. You know, if you're on Instagram, you know, you can just follow me over there and send me a message to that. And again, my team can get in touch with people and uh, they can help them out to start working in whichever they want to. So that can easily be done too. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that information. There is, uh, we have a viewer. Uh, she is asking, are hand tremors related to thyroid issues? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, so there are different kinds of hand tremors. So first of all, you know, like uh, in thyroid issue, the most common hand tremor that we see actually is with hyperthyroid. When actually instead of low thyroid, they are on the high side of the thyroid which is like Graves' disease, you know, or, or if somebody is over-medicated, like they're taking too much T4 hormone or levothyroxin and they start developing the hand tremor. So that's the most common tremor that we see. But we all, what I also see is that if somebody is under-medicated or if they're in, they have too much inflammation, especially if they have neurological inflammation, that also leads to very subtle hand tremors, which are very similar to what we call as like Parkinson's tremor, you know, where, you know, people do not have a full-blown issue with Parkinson's, but they're very similar resting tremors. So those for those people, then we need to work on their neurological inflammation, bring it down and improve it. Um, and sometimes it does get better. So those are two different kinds of tremors that can happen or that, you know, I see with thyroid patients. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, thank you for bringing up the hyperthyroidism. I want to uh, ask you your approach. Uh, so typically, uh, patients who I see with hyperthyroidism, and if they've come from like, uh, you know, an endocrinologist, two things are prescribed to them, like, uh, you know, a beta blocker to slow down their heart and like the antithyroid medication. And uh, mm -hmm. these patients are wanting to find a different solution, you know. And uh, usually a combination of herbal medicine has been pretty successful, you know. So I wanted to see um, what you have found that works in your practice. And, you know, uh, these patients who are hyperthyroid, because they have all the sym symptoms that are opposite to hypothyroidism, will their hyperthyroidism get better that's what they're curious about because of course with their heart racing they are very anxious they may have these tremors and all of this so um i wanted to see what your experience has been with that yeah so absolutely first of all you know like with hyperthyroid i'm always very careful to make sure that you know they have done all the workup that is needed you know like if they're seeing hopefully they have seen a specialist and they have done relevant scans to make sure it's not cancer you know, if there is any you know, chance of that, you know, then they're following with that. Uh, if once, you know, I'm reassured that, okay, it's not cancer and just need to be on medications, then again, you know, like hyperthyroid has very similar root causes where, you know, again, there is inflammation going on in their body. So as you said, you know, then we need to work on their diet, which food kind of plays an important role in controlling their thyroid process. So we put them on an anti-inflammatory diet to improve that. And then uh, certain herbal things, which again can help uh, to regulate the thyroid hormone and bring it down, uh, we do that. The important key is that, you know, like the beta blockers, we do not want to get them off very quickly because again, then, you know, they do not like it and, you know, their, uh, their heart rate or can go very high. So very slow process, you know, that we use to get them off medications. But as their numbers start getting better, then we start reducing the dose, you know, which you said antithyroid medication, which typically is methamazole is a typical medication that we use. So we slowly and slowly have them come off. So it's a slow process, but within like, you know, in a year or two, a lot of, you know, the patients can at least reduce the dosage of medicine and some of them can even come off. Excellent. Thank you. I love uh, your approach, you know, absolutely. 
um there is somebody asking hi hiral hiral is there we have a lot of viewers from india also so thank you guys for joining it's a night time over there so that's excellent so she's asking when your tsh is high ideally you should gain weight but if weight loss then would there be any other reason absolutely so like again you know tsh being high is just telling us that you know it can be hypothyroid right but again tsh is just one thyroid hormone right so as we discussed before then we need to look at the t3 the t4 the reverse t3 and also the inflammation markers right so that's very important and this scenario we will just make sure that the adrenals are also working fine so because that also plays an important role in weight gain and weight loss so it i think you know if you are having weight loss issue and the tsh is high then first of all we need to kind of do a complete evaluation why is that the situation so doing a complete hormonal panel to make sure that all the other hormones are fine um and also making sure that your diet is good and uh, then kind of making you know a plan based on that seeing that you know what else is going on because a lot of times there there has to be some other reason that is causing the weight loss just the high tsh you know doesn't give me enough enough information yes thank you so much uh, hiral hopefully that uh, answered your question so uh if any of you have any other questions uh you know dr gupta is here answering them for you really appreciate all his time and knowledge and sharing all this great information with you so thank you so much uh everyone yeah yes. it is my pleasure you know that's what my goal is to help as many people with thyroid disorder to get better so the more information people have this always nice because then that that's way you know they know that there is a there is a better world out there they don't have to suffer all the time and you know they can get their thyroid under control with you know with so many natural ways yes we have uh, somebody asking if you do telemedicine and i would say say yes uh, dr gupta was just sharing his website and you can reach out but if you want to answer that better uh, please do yeah so you know that's what you know my i have a virtual practice so we do a zoom call uh, to help our clients so we do telemedicine in that way so uh, as i was sharing my website is anshulguptamd.com uh, so you can reach me over there or you know you can just you know a private message me on instagram and my team will get back to you um, with more information excellent and she's thanking Uh, thank you for all the good info and thank you for listening and thank you for tuning in today so so thank you so much dr gupta it's been uh, wonderful talking with you on a friday morning and um uh thank you everyone and uh if you know you have further questions please feel free to reach dr gupta uh and wish you all a wonderful weekend thank you again Yeah thank you so much Meghna for having me it was really nice chatting with you um keep doing the good work and you know hopefully we will catch back again sometime later Yes that sounds fantastic thank you very much and thank you for all the great things you are doing as well have yeah, a wonderful right. weekend Yep you too have okay. a great week bye bye Thank you thank you bye bye mm-hmm. Thanks everyone